Hello, I'm CJ Wellerman. Please don't forget to subscribe to our show. Now let's get into it. The question on everybody's lips is why won't the Muslim world do anything to save the Palestinian people from Israel's mass extermination program in Gaza, where more than 12,000 have been killed, including a staggering 5,000 children during the past five weeks, in which the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation have sat passively on the sidelines, seemingly deaf, dumb, and mute to this genocide. I mean, we have come to expect support for Zionist terrorism from the West, but in action and even tacit support for Israel from the governments of Muslim countries is something entirely different. Take the United Arab Emirates, for example. It told Israel that there's no level of violence and suffering it can inflict upon the Palestinians that would make the UAE end its support for the Zionist enterprise, which sadly typifies a response from nearly all of the Arab Gulf monarchies all of whom have forged close ties with Israel during the past decade. The absence of a meaningful and powerful response from Muslim leaders has left ordinary Muslim people around the world feeling helpless, powerless and distraught. They have watched on hopelessly as Israel deliberately bombs hospitals, refugee camps, food and water supplies, along with critical infrastructure. They have seen 1.7 million Palestinians from a population of 2.2 million be forcibly expelled from their homes and driven south towards Egypt, constituting the biggest forced expulsion since the 1948 Nakba. They have witnessed things they had hoped to never see in a lifetime. Like babies pulled from the wombs of dying mothers, young children with limbs blown apart by Israeli bombs, but somehow still managing to hold on to life. As stray dogs eat the dead because the sheer scale of this unrelenting mass murder has left many unable to locate or bury the bodies of their loved ones. If a single moment could capture the frustration and heartache that Muslims across the world feel towards their leaders at this very moment in time, then it would be this. His feelings are shared by hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world, who are now marching in protest against Israel's barbarism and savagery, at least where they can, while specifically democratic countries that allow public protests. Like Indonesia, where more than one million of my former compatriots took to the streets of the capital Jakarta. And also here in Istanbul, Turkey, where incredible scenes were filmed from above the surging crowds like this. And like this football game in Malaysia, where 50,000 fans erupted in pro-Palestinian songs and chants. This is the Ummah. This is global solidarity for Gaza from the Muslim street. But the question remains, what are leaders of the Muslim world actually doing to save Palestinians from this genocide? Well, the short answer is absolutely nothing. Not a single thing. The best they can do is hold an emergency meeting of the Arab League and Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which was convened in Saudi Arabia on Saturday, to hear directly from the Palestinian representative about the situation in Gaza. The Palestinian people are being exposed to the most horrific and brutal aggression, and even to unparalleled war of annihilation at the hands of the Israeli war machine which violated sanctities of international humanitarian law and crossed all red lines in the Gaza Strip by killing and wounding more than 40,000 Palestinian civilians. Muslim leaders condemned Israel's actions in Gaza and called for an immediate ceasefire, but refused, and I mean stubbornly refused, to approve a single punitive economic or political action against the Zionist state over its ongoing atrocities in the occupied Palestinian territories. No oil embargo, no financial embargo, no sanctions, no cutting of diplomatic ties or anything, quite frankly. Just empty words and vacuous platitudes. This is a profile in cowardice, greed and corruption, as exemplified by the Saudi government, which has denied calls to use its oil resources as leverage against Israel. I mean, my oh my, how times have changed. Remembering that Saudi Arabia's King Faisal cut his country's oil production in response to US support for Israel during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Good evening. The Middle East War produced developments all over the world today 
the oil producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. If the Arab countries keep that pledge, it would reduce their production by almost 50% in one year. This was when Arab leaders actually dared to stand up for the Palestinian people and against Zionism and against American imperialism. But today, these regimes do not wish to confront Western powers because dictatorships and monarchies in the Middle East have enriched themselves by working with the West and not against it. As illustrated by the recent Abraham Accords, in which several Muslim-majority countries agreed to normalize the apartheid Israeli regime three years ago in exchange for lucrative economic trade deals with Israel and access to US military hardware. In other words, Arab Gulf monarchies do not want confrontation with the United States. They seek protection from the United States, particularly against their arch nemesis, the Iranian regime. But it's important to note that these deals do not benefit ordinary Muslims in the Middle East, but only the dictators and authoritarians who use American and Israeli surveillance technologies to repress their restive populations, as we revealed in a recent episode. And to that end, these Arab governments are extremely fearful that pro-Palestinian protests could end up being turned against their repressive rule. Because while these regimes have always seen the Palestinian issue as a way for their people to vent their anger, they fear that these protests could also take a domestic turn against them, like it did during the Arab Spring of 2011. You see, for many ordinary people in the Middle East, the Palestinian cause was their gateway into politics. And everyone is acutely aware that it was the potential Saudi normalization deal with Israel that sparked Hamas into taking the kind of action it did on October 7th. Knowing that a pending deal between the Guardian of Islam and the Zionist state would forever sideline the Palestinian liberation cause. The Hamas attack was not only an act of utter desperation, but also a cry for help to the Muslim world, which had largely turned its back on the Palestinians in exchange for the economic benefits that come from playing within, not against, the US ruled international order. But with all of that said, there are many reasons to be optimistic for the immediate and long term future. You see, the one thing that Arab Gulf regimes crave more than anything is legitimacy. They want to be seen by their people as legitimate rulers, not as totalitarian despots who rule only by fear, repression and terror. They also know that totalitarian rule is unsustainable because eventually the people will rise up against them as they did in Egypt, Tunisia and Syria 12 years ago. Legitimacy eventuates only when the people feel an organic connection with their rulers. Therefore, these regimes should see the Israeli genocide in Gaza as an opportunity to make an organic connection with their people, and the quickest way to achieve that would be to take concrete actions that stand up to Israel and the United States. Because people of the Middle East see the Palestinian struggle as a reflection of their own struggle for dignity and freedom, which is why they feel such a profoundly strong bond with the Palestinian people who with few resources are willing to stand up to the strongest military in the region, Israel, and the world's number one superpower, the United States. So to the Arab monarchies, I promise you this, that if Gaza falls, with the Palestinian population annihilated, then your regime will eventually fall too. Because under no circumstances will 2 billion Muslims, representing a third of the global population, put up with that. And if you're looking for evidence to support my warning, then pay attention to how the Muslim voice has pressured the United States into changing course. Look at what's happening in Palestine today. When I said to you earlier that Blinken buckled and that the humanitarian pause after Blinken banned his State Department from using the word ceasefire, when Blinken is now talking about humanitarian pause, he buckled because the ordinary Muhammad, Sara, Zara, and all these other different Muslims decided to tweet on social media. Those Muslims said to themselves, Ya Allah, I don't have an army, I don't have a foreign minister, I don't have a big business, I don't have lots of money, but I have want, I want to use the powers that, are with, that you have given me in order to advance the cause of Islam and advance the cause of Palestine. They took one step, Allah took 10 and amplified the voice and Blinken is now bucketing. Jalali. Muslim leaders should follow the path taken by Bahrain and Malaysia, which have either chosen to cut ties with Israel or refuse to obey the United States. The ball is now firmly in their court, so now we wait. Anyway, that's my time for today. 
please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and we kindly ask you please support our effort to expose and confront injustices in the Muslim world by becoming a member of this show at patreon.com slash CJ We can't produce, sustain and grow this show without your help and we offer exclusive benefits to those who do. But for now, good night, good morning, wherever you are and stay blessed. Thank you.